Kia ora tato. Uh, I'm facilitating this session and um, this session is on PIAC, the Programme for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies and the results which will be coming out, of which New Zealand is involved, will be coming out in 2016. So this session is about PIAC, um, what it can and cannot tell us and what those implications are for when uh, the results come out. The two um, presenters um, I'd like to introduce now. The first is um, Professor Dana Coben, who is the, uh, our director of the National Centre of Literacy and Numeracy for Adults. Diana is New Zealand's only and the world's only professor of adult numeracy. So we're very lucky to have Diana with us. Um, she's also um, a Professor Emeritus of King's College in, in London. Uh, she has very interesting ideas. She has a whole lot of research at her fingertips. And for those of you who are interested in Freya, you, you, you'd be interested to know that Diana wrote a very interesting book on Gramsci and Freya and um, expect to have a very interesting conversation with Diana about that. David Earle, co-presenter. David Earle is New Zealand's Chief Research Analyst in Tertiary Sector Performance, Performance Analysis at the Ministry of Education, and David's work in this space has been really valuable for where we are with, the, with literacy and numeracy for adults. Not only his thinking, but his skills and his application of that work and his ability to work with us, amongst us, and with all of us has been really valuable. So thank you, David, for being part of this session. So over to you two. Thank you. Okay, so our title is uh, The Latest International Survey of Adult Skills, What Does PIAC Mean for Us in New Zealand? And we're going to explore that question through a series of slides, which I'm going to start off with. So this is a view of PIAC from the inside. Yep, this is a view of PIAC from the inside, the PIAC insiders speaking. So we want you to just listen to a short clip from this, um, as it were, official video about the survey. Uh, the speakers are people who have been directly involved in the uh, sort of genesis and design of the, the project one way or another. So if you can flip to Erwin. Evolutionary theory tells us that it's not just the strongest species that survive, nor is it the most intelligent species. It's the species that are most adaptable to change. And in this modern world, we find ourselves in a rapidly changing environment where education and skills have taken on increased importance. The biggest thing people don't understand is what's happened to the labor market as a result of the merger of technology and globalization. There's been this skills bias polarization. So if you have the skills in education today to take advantage of the IT revolution, uh, you're going to be fine. You're, you're going to be fine and, and your wages will be fine and you will uh, have the ability to take advantage of this new world. But if you don't have that education, you're you're in real trouble. Basically, our economies had, a, in the past, had a great capacity to absorb low-skilled people. Uh, they could find a place in agriculture and a lot of uh, low-skilled uh, jobs that uh, don't exist anymore, that are rapidly disappearing. In this global economy where all work that can be digitized, automated and outsourced can be done anywhere, you know, you compete with people anywhere in the world. We've blown a hole right in the middle of the labor market. So if you've got that technological education and skills, critical thinking, you're going to be fine. If you don't, you, you could fall right off the map. Large numbers of our own adults are sitting around depressed, unemployed, unable to see any future. And these are not, pe you know, these are not people who don't want to work. These are not people who are incapable of working. These are people who are disenfranchised by their lack of skills. When I was at Gateway Community College, I was with this bright young guy, 33-year-old electrician, he's doing fine. But there were two other guys who were there struggling with the instruction that was going on. One was a, a long-distance truck driver who'd been laid off, and the other one had been laid off as a warehouse guy, who obviously just been moving stuff around. 
That was tough for them to try to learn a new skill set. That's a population, not just in this country, but around the world, that doesn't have a very bright future in the modern workplace. And uh, they'll become, in effect, wards of the state. Okay. Those of you who want to listen to the or see the whole video, uh, there'll be a link at the end of the presentation, and this will go on our website, so you'll be able to do that. So that's a view of PIAC from, as I say, insiders. Um, one of the last speakers there, Alison Wolfe, a colleague of mine at King's College London, passionately committed to the role, the, the sort of the way that the international survey can trigger improvement for adults' lives with literacy and numeracy seen as a really important uh, way of helping people to become sort of a active parts of the, the technological society. Although, interestingly, one of the changes which I've noticed over the years, and we'll maybe talk about this a bit more in a moment, is the way that the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which uh, is the sort of parent of uh, PIAC is actually stepping back from identifying a level at which one becomes equipped to deal with modern society. They used to be rather more, uh, how can I put this, upfront <laughs> about what that level was, and it was level three, but not, uh, not so at the moment, or not, not so now. So our focus questions for our uh, plenary today are here. What can PIAC tell us? And as important, actually, what can it not tell us? What kinds of shifts might we expect to see over the past 10 years? Because it will be 10 years by the time that the results for New Zealand come out. What might PIAC mean for us as educators, for learners, and for the general public? And what are the implications of PIAC specifically for educators? So those are really the sort of questions around which we've built our presentation. So we hope you'll be able to see those strands working through. So for those of you who don't know, <laughs> we're talking in uh, New Zealand about a round two PIAC country, round one some of you may have seen publicity around last October when the round one results, the countries which were in round one, were released. David and I constituted the New Zealand delegation which went to uh, a conference in Washington, D.C. where these results were announced and uh, a lot of very interesting um, presentations there about what the results meant for the various countries and the way they were interpreted was a study in itself actually as well as what the actual results said. Um, just to be confusing, PIAC in New Zealand is going to be known as the International Survey of Adult Skills, ISAS. So if you come across ISAS, it's not necessarily a terrorist group fighting in the Middle East. It's, <laughs> it's the International Survey of Adult Skills in New Zealand. So there's a sort of branding issue going on there. Um, David can say a bit more about the sort of sample size and all of that, but as you know, the population of New Zealand is roughly four and a half million. So, as I say, we're in round two. The domains <coughs> which are assessed in PIAC are literacy, numeracy, problem solving in technology-rich environments. I'll say a bit more about those in a moment. There's also a very important strand, I think, anyway, of interviews with uh, the sample of adults. Um, these are all adults of working age, so 16 to 65. Um, and... The, the survey will gather background data as well as the specific uh, answers to the test items. So there will be a lot of very useful data which we need to find ways of using as a community of adult literacy and numeracy uh, interested people. Um, incredibly valuable, really. PIAC builds on the previous surveys, which you've probably heard of, IELTS, International Adult Literacy Survey, and the Adult Literacy and Life Skills Survey, all. And that will mean that there's comparison in certain domains, not all, over that whole period. For those of you, does any, has anybody been interviewed for PIAC already? We might have someone in the room who's... No? Okay. <laughs> the field trial was uh, undertaken April to September, Data collection is going on right now, and as, as Nikki said, the results will be published in 2016. So 
That gives you a sort of thumbnail sketch. The domains I mentioned, just to go through each of them quite quickly. Quite a lot of work went into actually defining what is literacy, what is numeracy, and actually identifying the scope of the domains. Um, they've changed over the years, so IELTS didn't look at numeracy, it looked at something called quantitative literacy, which is actually in many ways rather different. So the comparison for numeracy only really works with all. So this is the definition of literacy. I'm not going to sort of read it out, but you can see there what, the, um, what it's about. Um, I think important to say, point out, if you weren't aware, it doesn't involve writing. So literacy actually is a proxy for reading here. It doesn't, well, it's a definition in, involving reading, not involving writing. Some of us think that's a bit of a flaw, but there you go. Uh, numeracy, the ability to access, use, interpret, and communicate mathematical information and ideas with a very strong emphasis on how those are actually played out in relation to the mathematical demands of adult life. And the new domain within PIAC, problem solving in technology rich environments. And it was very noticeable to me at the conference I mentioned in Washington DC that um, this felt like the newest domain. It felt a bit ragged. I don't know if David would agree about that, yeah. Um, whereas literacy and numeracy felt like they'd got a bit of history behind them in terms of what these domains actually meant. This one felt that it was still being formed, really. So it's younger, <laughs> um, but a very important area. And of course, uh, very much indicating in a way, in its name, that these are not totally discrete areas. You know, problem solving in technology rich environments inevitably involves literacy very often involves numeracy. So the other areas which I mentioned, which PIAC will also collect information on, is the actual activities that people uh, use and do in their, in their daily lives, including their use of information communication technology. They'll be asked about skills needed for their work and whether their skills and qualifications match what they're required to do in their work. So a very comprehensive set of data. This will be really the first time it's been quite as comprehensive as this, so very important. Now, this is just an overview of the way the domains have changed slightly over the years, um, and the terminology has changed. So, um, <laughs> you know, we've gone from skills to competencies, and one can read into that what one likes, but... Um, and also the use of the term literacy in the IELTS survey and to a certain extent also in the ALL survey as a bit of a catch-all including numeracy. And some of you will have heard me say that I don't think that's a terribly good idea because what tends to happen is numeracy gets lost. I don't think numeracy did get lost in the ALL survey because it was a, a specific domain, but nevertheless, uh, that can certainly happen. So that's the uh, sort of way that the domains have panned out historically. And as I've noted at the bottom there, quantitative literacy scores in IELTS can't be compared directly with numeracy because the actual description of the domain changed, definition of the domain changed. So if we look back um, at IELTS, which was 1996, I think, yeah. Um, the, we, there was a similar uh, distribution of skills in New Zealand by comparison with Australia, the USA, and the UK. Approximately one in five, 20% of New Zealanders were reckoned to be highly effective in, new, in literacy. Bearing in mind literacy there was used as the portmanteau term for all of the domains they were looking at. Um, less good in terms of that uh, notion of literacy at document and quantitative literacy than in prose literacy. For New Zealand, the majority of Maori, Pacifica, and other ethnic minority groups were found to be fun functioning below this notional level of competence, which, as I say, OECD is rather stepped back from defining, but nevertheless, in the IELTS days, they definitely were defining as level three, that there was a clear relationship between people's status within the labor force and how much money they were earning and their level of literacy. And maybe unsurprisingly, that people who stayed on at school longer were 
getting better scores than those who left early. This is not perhaps rocket science. You, you might expect that to happen if the schools are doing any kind of good job. But <laughs> anyway, that, that was borne out in the figures. And encouragingly, uh, Māori with tertiary qualifications were on a par with um, European Pākehā um, respondents in the IELTS survey. So some interesting points there. I'm not going to go through all of these, but all uh, this is all on the Ministry of Education um, website for those who want to follow up in more detail. Um, between the IELTS survey and the All survey, so that 10-year period, 96 to 2006, the proportion with very low literacy skills, there was a substantial reduction. So something good was happening. <laughs> but there is still a proportion with low literacy skills. So that's, you know, in a way the, the, the issue became more clearly located, perhaps, in the, in the All survey. The improvement in document literacy was more pronounced here than it was in Canada, USA, or Australia. But those countries also have large subpopulations with low numeracy skills. And also, because all introduced, I forgot to say this, all introduced problem solving, although not the new version, which is problem solving in technology-rich environments. Um, and the uh, populations uh, there were also... Um, found to be sort of low in, in Canada and Australia. One of the things here mentioned there that problem solving wasn't me measured in the USA, countries have a certain amount of leeway, which maybe David can say a bit more about, in terms of exactly how they operate the surveys. So the USA ducked out of problem solving. One might wonder why. <laughs> anyway, um, so unsurprisingly, again, New Zealand adults with low document literacy skills in the All Survey were less likely to participate in bringing their skills up. Now, that's maybe chicken and egg. Maybe they needed the document literacy in order to do that. Um, however, yes, it, it was a confusing picture in a way because the, uh, the results didn't... Do you want to say anything about that, though? Because it was quite a... The fact that the participation in formal upskilling doesn't appear to be affected by adults' document literacy skills. So if you were already in the upskilling... Would you, is that how you'd interpret that? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Okay, we'll come back to that. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, you, you can see the, the sort of general, the general picture there. Um, interesting stuff about recent immigrants, um, uh, both recent and established New Zealand immigrants have higher or had higher levels of prose and numeracy skills than both recent and established immigrants in Canada and USA. So maybe that's reflecting different patterns of immigration in, in those countries. So some very interesting um, and thought-provoking things there. So what's new in PIAC? Well, um, instead of document and prose literacy as two separate constructs, literacy is treated as a single construct in PIAC, the new problem-solving in technology-rich environments that I've already mentioned. Um, there's a reading components option, which maybe David can say a bit more at the moment. It's a computer-adaptive assessment. In other words, if you are being asked the questions, or you're the, the punter, as it were, and you are struggling, you're, you're basically given some test questions, or some sort of initial questions to start with, and from that, you're rooted into questions at different levels. So if you're struggling with the initial questions, you won't be asked harder and harder ones, which just you know, mean that you can't continue. You will be asked questions which the uh, computer program is programmed to think that you have a better chance of being able to answer. Is that right? Okay. The extended background information I've already mentioned, so I won't mention that again. And now I'd like to hand over to David, who's going to take you through some nitty-gritty results, well, looking at it all in PIAC in terms of results. Okay. Okay, as Diana was saying, we've still got to wait till 2016 for results. Um, so what I've I'm presenting here are the results mostly from round one countries to give you an idea of what might be in the PIAC results that we get for New Zealand. So on the left here we have the, dis this is just looking at the average 
um, scale scores for countries by document literacy and numeracy. And on the left is what we had in all with the countries that were in both in the all survey and in PIAC. There's actually not a huge crossover because all was such a small, had such a small take up of countries. Um, and then what the same distribution scores have come out of the round one countries for PIAC. So New Zealand is the red diamond and in all we were sitting fairly close to Canada and Australia. It's almost on top of each other. Netherlands and Norway were performing somewhat higher than us, um, United States somewhat lower. The PIAC results have actually shifted everything around. So there's not a, the first thing is it's not a kind of clear sense of some countries, all countries have moved in the same direction. Um, Canada were distressed that their results have gone down, particularly for numeracy. Um, United States has also slipped slightly. So there are things going on within countries that affect where they end up on average. And so I think a lot of attention will be on where are we at this kind of very summary point of an average score, but it's very hard to read a lot of meaning into that and to have a lot of expectation about it. The only one where there's a huge change actually is Italy, and I, I, don't, I meant to go and have a look at why Italy moved so much. I don't know. Um, I'm have to, going to have to go through these very quickly. Um, so just going over some highlights, looking at Australia, Canada, um, and England and Northern Ireland, which were the two parts of the United Kingdom that participated. Um, probably the most interest, one of the most interesting things is the blue shaded area is the proportion of the population who were able to do the computer-based assessment. If you didn't have basic computer skills, you were put into a paper-based assessment. As it shows um, fairly clearly, it is age-related. People who are younger were more likely to do computer-based assessment, but in very few countries were there anything like 100% of young people doing it. So, it, and in fact, underneath this raises the questions that there is a substantial group of young people who are not mm -hmm. technology people. Um, so we can make some generalizations about age, but it also brings some of those into question. Um, the other is just to look at the contrast between Australia and England in terms of the age profile. So Australian young people scored fairly high in terms of their literacy, numeracy and problem solving. In England there is this big dip in the youth population. So there's some huge differences in um, what's going on across generations and that's of huge concern in the English policy environment as to why that's happening. Um, education, just again, and it shows, as we know, there is a relationship between levels of education and literacy. I think what's interesting is more on the left. On the right is what you expect, that there is a convergence um, of scores across countries for people with a bachelor's level and above. But on the left, as to those in the, the left bar who really have no qualifications, there's very different distributions across countries as to what's going on with those, that group of people. Um, social outcomes, just to really give you a sense of the range of things that are asked in the background questionnaire. So there's questions about health, um, trust, voluntary activities, level of political efficacy, and all of those show a relationship. Um, this is comparing um, people scoring below level one in literacy having a poor social outcome compared to those with a high score. So there is a definite relationship showing up between literacy and experiencing poor social outcomes. Again, apologies for rushing through, but there's a lot to cover. Um, the other area that the um, survey covers is around, the, which is really quite new, is the match between what you think the skills you have for your job are and what, what skills you have and what you think the skills are for your job. So it's asked in two different ways. One on the left is around qualifications and whether you think a series of questions about what are the qualifications needed to do the job you're doing. Um, and the interesting thing there is really the dark blue are the people who feel that they're overqualified for their jobs. So there is as much issue about people working 
in jobs they're overqualified for as there is in working in jobs that they're underqualified for. The literacy and numeracy skills match uses a different methodology. It's not comparable with the qualifications in terms of the proportions, but it is showing the same kind of thing about the proportion of people who are working in jobs that they either have way too much skill for compared to other people in those jobs or don't have the same level of skill. And so there's problems with both overqualifying and underqualifying. So there's an issue about where people whether people are in the jobs that they are best skilled for. Uh, but the majority do actually fall in the middle. Uh, it's not a, a show-stopping issue, but it is definitely an issue at the margins. Um, the other area of new, much more extended information compared to all is the use of skills at work. So just for those with eyesight as crappy as mine, um, down the side, the Legend is task discretion, learning skills, influencing, cooperative skills, self-organizing, dexterity, and physical skills. The thing that really interested me is across the three countries, these graphs almost look the same. So the distribution of skills required, and this is what people do, the frequency with which people use these skills in their jobs, is not actually that different across these three English-speaking countries. Um, but there are differences, and this is in terms of whether people have have not got a lower as they haven't got a school qualification, and higher means they've got a post school qualification. And there are differences in where people with different levels of education use the skills. So at the bottom, with physical skills, not surprisingly, people with lower educational levels are more likely to be in jobs that require physical skills. Um, there's not much difference going up in terms of dexterity, um, self-organizing, people with higher skills and higher education are more likely to be required to be self-organizing. Cooperative skills are actually even across the education levels, and then influencing, you're more likely to be doing that if you've got higher skills. So it's, it's just one cut of that information. There's a lot richer information available around that use of skills at work. So... Um, Going back to the video, this is actually where that video was shot before the PIAC results came out. So this is actually around what's happening in terms of occupational change and skill levels across 24 OECD countries with all of their information combined. Um, so first of all, it looks at occupations that have the lowest average scores. And they make up about 30% of the workforce and that has stayed pretty even since uh, 1998. So low-skilled jobs are with us, probably will always be with us. They're, not a, they're there and they're fairly stable. Um, the next level is those with the next, lowest, next to lowest average scores, and this is where the jobs are disappearing. This is the group that is losing traction. It's not the very lowest skilled, but the ones next up. And then, oh, sorry. Then the next to highest is actually about even, and then the, the growth area, as I was saying at the beginning of the video, are the ones with the very highest skills, and that's where the job growth is. So the job loss is actually in the middle. It's not at the very bottom which is slightly different to what was being said in the, the video in terms of where the results are. So this graph just shows the changes in percentages to make that clearer. So that's the ones with the lowest skills. It's the ones who are just above the lowest skills where the jobs are disappearing. Um, the ones who are kind of next below high, it's even and the job growth is the ones with the very highest skills. So this is, this is the effect of automation. Um, it's actually a, it's not the most manual labor that's disappearing. It's the level above that that is being automated out and the technician management level, which is getting demand um, growing. Yeah, do you want to? point out some, uh, this will go on our website so you'll be able to click on these links. 
There's been a, so there is an ongoing study of responses to PIAC Round 1, which will continue through PIAC Round 2, um, in terms of gathering together responses from different countries, from media and commentators, journalists, and so on. Um, and just to give you a little thumbnail sketch in terms of the Round 1 um, responses, Muted and mixed in Canada, minimal in USA, probably because the results came out just when the federal government closed down, do you remember? <laughs> so there wasn't a lot, um, you know, just hit the wrong spot in terms of the timing for um, great coverage, really, there. Alarm in England and Northern Ireland, uh, as David mentioned, the uh, sort of shock that is being felt around the low scores of young people which was showing no greater skills than people over 55. So if you want to follow up on that, uh, the resources are being gathered together by the Centre for Literacy of Quebec, and the link is there. OECD has done early analysis of media reactions, and the, the link is there. That OECD, as I say, is the parent body which um, established uh, the series of, of surveys, which, of which PIAC is the latest one. And there are, of course, lots of blogs online and uh, other varieties are available, but I just would recommend to you Ralph Sinclair's uh, Literacy and Learning blog. Um, he's actually from Scotland but working in Canada and very interesting insights on his blog, so recommend that to you. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip through a little bit. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so just looking at some possible results for New Zealand, um, this is using a method which takes the uh, takes a multivariate model um, of the results from all and then applies it to current population data. So it says basically if we had the same, if we repeated the all survey again in 2012 and all that changed was the characteristics of the people in the population, where would we be in 2012. Um, so the first thing is that we've actually got a huge shift in our population from 2006 to 2012. So the dark bars are where the distribution of the population in 2006. And in those six years, there has been uh, basically a shift of the baby boom generation have got older, so that kind of peak that was around 35, 39 has moved across, and we've got an increase in the youth population at the same time. Um, so the shape of the population has changed by age. Um, that's the kind of average distribution of literacy um, according to all. It follows a kind of curve, as, as you saw in the earlier graphs, um, and that's using our kind of predictive modelling, that's where we would think we would end up with the distribution of skills by age if we repeat it all this year. Um, so there would be people in the kind of middle age band, we'd expect to see some increase in skills, and this comes through having a more, slightly more educated population in those age groups. Um, and more people participating in tertiary education particularly. There is some question about whether there would be any gain at the, in the 15 to 19 year olds and that's, that little drop down is actually reflecting the greater ethnic um, diversity of that population. Um, so we've allowed for Māori and Pacifica um, performance in there. Now the, the issue is that actually while there's um, well, there's an overall pattern of gain, and the, the curve is looking higher, population is running against that. Um, so if we look at it in this way, we've got, as I said, there's an area, <coughs> there's changes in the, oh, sorry, starting with the mean document literacy, I've got it around the right way, we're seeing an increase possibly in the overall proportion of people who have, or the mean document literacy of people between 20 and 45 as a result of educational shifts. Um, hopefully that shows up well enough. 
But where we are seeing the biggest increase is where we're also seeing this, the largest drop in population. So they're a shrinking part of the population. Where there is a possible drop, we're actually seeing that in areas of population that are growing. So the change in population is going against the change in skills, um, which suggests that actually we probably won't see a significant change in the average literacy skills of the country between the All Survey and the PX Survey. We'll see it in terms of particular age groups, but it gets washed out by the fact that the, there's a change in the demographic shape of the country. Um, so that's kind of how it summarises up in terms of this kind of predictive approach. What will actually happen in the survey? Well, that's what we need to wait and find out. There'll be other factors that aren't taken into account here that could go either way. Now, the other thing you're kind of thinking, well, we've done a huge amount. One of those other factors is a huge amount of work that everyone in this room has been involved in in terms of adult literacy and numeracy. So over the period from 2010 to 2013, it's been nearly a quarter of a million learners assessed on the assessment tool, which represents um, some part of the effort that's been going on. And what we're able to do is do some comparison between um, the assessment tool steps and the all levels and do some translation of that. And there's a paper I've just put out about that, um, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. Um, and what we can see is the distribution of this is the distribution of assessment tool results for those 225,000 learners that have been through the tool. Most of them are sitting um, at step four and step three on the assessment tool steps is for reading, um, sorry, I should say. Um, we haven't, we could also do this for numeracy as well. And that translates over to about 70% of them being at level two or below using the all step, all levels. Um, so it is, we're targeting the right group, we're targeting the right um, levels, we're getting a large number of people through. The thing to realise is that still is not huge in terms of population, overall population. Um, so we're going the right way. So this is looking at the distribution of skills on using the all levels on the 2012 population and then putting those numbers in proportion. So the, the ones who are assessed, I think we assessed around about 10% of the equivalent of people who are at level one in the population, around about 15% equivalent of those who are at level two, about 8% equivalent of those who are at level three. So yes, there's a huge amount of work being done and a huge effort going in, but it's also just starting to, only just starting to hit um, a small part of the total population um, area. now so uh, just want to leave you with some questions really so what use are you able to make of all of this what does PIAC or what can PIAC mean for you your organization your your region your city um, what can it tell you that you need to know and what can it not tell you and how can you use PIAC data to improve how can we all use it to improve our work? And I think that last slide was very telling for me. It shows to me what a huge amount of work there is still to be done, that gap between the, uh, you know, the actual uh, projected um, population and the, uh, the, the PIAC levels is, is quite sort of telling, the all levels. So what light um, does PIAC and do earlier surveys shed on issues relevant to your interest and how will PIAC add to that information. We have very short time now for questions, but we would like to hear from you if there are some pressing questions people would like to ask. Um, thanks, David and Dana. Really interesting graph, that last one, that, that shows the scale of provision we're not able to meet. It'd be really interesting to look at the investment gap between what's going in at the moment and what you'd need to double that to, uh, to, treat, you know, to get twice as many learners, particularly in, in the lower two levels. 
Um, my, my question really is around, um, and this is still probably speculative, observations about, about what the UK think they might, might be the reasons for that very, you know, that very strange thing about young people's performance and what, you know, Diana, you've been there yeah. looking, at, looking in? <laughs> it's highly contentious. There's been lots of debate about this. Um, obviously, some people are using it to say, well, this is because of changes in the uh, schooling system that have not favoured young people as they were intended to do. I think it's, <laughs> it's always a, a problem with these surveys that it, it's, the results come out and you hear the grinding of axes. <laughs> so I think um, the shock horror was pretty great at the time and I think there's still it's being worked through as to what it actually means but it is very concerning very concerning indeed and people are very concerned but there isn't agreement I think I can say about what the cause is really or how you interpret what the cause is depends a lot on your political persuasion and how you think education should be uh, organised for the bulk of the population in schooling terms. Um, no, I'm not sure I can add much more than that. I think my hunch is that there is an issue of diversity under that, that um, the UK has now got such a broadly diverse youth population compared to its older population, and that hasn't been addressed in the schooling system particularly well. And it, it's a warning that we are facing exactly that same situation in New Zealand. And I should have said there'll be more coming through on the National Centre website around PX, so watch this space.